while working at leading health and deep tech startups in New Zealand, namely Soul Machines and Heart Lab. He holds a mathematics degree and physics degree uh, from the University of Canterbury, where he has been awarded scholarships for excellence in mathematics. In his PhD, he will spearhead the integration of physical laws into deep neural networks to address more complex registration problems and discover material properties of biological tissues. As an application, such, a, such an integrated approach will be suitable for mapping breast tissue between diagnostic and preoperative positions, which is clinically relevant for breast cancer treatment planning. So today I'm going to be talking about information about breast MRI and a technique with the problem, but it involves a few more but resolution deep learning. Don't worry if you don't understand what that means at the moment, I'll get to that soon. Um, this is the awesome team that I worked with um, on this research project. Uh, you'll see some familiar faces from today, um, <laughs> some familiar faces online and Sean in person. So just to begin with, uh, talk a bit about breast cancer. So there's a 12% incidence rate of breast cancer globally and 30% in New Zealand. Uh, so that's quite large incidence rates. MRI is the gold standard um, image modality for breast cancer imaging. And um, when you do an MRI, you can inject the contrast agent into the patient, which uh, collects in the tumor region and appears very bright. Um, However, this uh, image is taken in the prone position while treatment is performed in the supine position. And so there's a large change in the um, breast between these positions, uh, which makes it very challenging to track the tumor location. And um, this can lead to a 20 to 40% uh, reoperation rate for patients. So it's been a lot of work into hybrid approaches to map the breast tissue between the prone and the supine position. And so these hybrid approaches involve biomechanics to estimate the, uh, like a large part of the deformation and then uh, registration, which picks up the residual deformation. Um, however, these approaches still cannot account for uh, all the motion between the prone and supine positions. So um, just for some context, Registration is simply finding the displacement between two images. It's a nonlinear and non-convex problem, traditionally solved by gradient-based methods. Uh, these gradient-based methods, they're uh, based on the, uh, on the work of Horn and Shah. They showed that linearization of the equations of motion leads to a linear relationship between the temporal gradients of two images and the motion flow. So here's a 1D example uh, where you can see uh, we can extract the um, displacement U using just the two images and the spatial gradient of um, one of the images. Uh, this becomes a lot more complicated in three dimensions where uh, you end up with an ill-posed problem and you need an additional constraint. Also, this linearization it only holds true when the deformation is small. And as I've mentioned, the deformation between the uh, two positions for the braces is quite large. So a small deformation model would be just adding the displacement to the coordinates, and this would be considered um, a fancy term for it would be non-diffeomorphic. So you know these types of um, parameterization of the deformation don't always give you a inverse. Uh, for example, if you were to add the displacement and then subtract the displacement of um, this, display, this um, deformation field, you'll find when you take the composition of that displacement and it's inverse, um, you don't get the identity and you would expect that from a deformation in this inverse. Whereas if there's been work to establish these diffeomorphic um, frameworks and they are guaranteed to be bijective and topology preserving. Um, that also means that when you take the deformation and it's inverse, you get approximately the identity you will get some small error from integration. So there's been a lot of work in deep learning registration, uh, particularly on the 
type of architecture you use for deep learning registration. All of them um, based on, not all of them, but a substantial amount of them are based on convolutional neural networks um, and a unit type architecture. And then the very recent work has been um, into integrating uh, multi-resolution techniques into these architectures. Um, so these are two architectures that I want to give as an example. This is the Laplacian Perimeter Network. This is diffeomorphic and um, multi-resolution. It uses multiple networks to predict the multi-resolution deformations. Um, it has mixed feature pairs, so when you input the images, there's no way to decouple um, the features that you generate. Um, and they propagate the, the stationary velocity fields um, from the diffeomorphic approach using addition, which is a first order approximation. There's also SuperWalk, which is a really nice, efficient way of doing the multi-resolution um, approach, but uh, it's non-diffeomorphic. So uh, there's still some gaps in you know, having a nice multi-resolution approach that is also diffeomorphic. Um, also the training approaches that you use to um, uh, learn to do registration, uh, there's, there's two main approaches, the unsupervised approach, where you don't have ground truth deformations, you have uh, an image loss, uh, plus a, a regularizer, which imposes some <laughs> on the predictive deformation. A uh, really early example of this is voxel morph that used UNET plus a diffusion-based regularizer, so something like the, gra the normal gradient of the uh, displacement field. And then there's been research into supervised approaches, which require ground truth. However, you can um, generate ground truth using data limitation, but then obviously your approach becomes super dependent on how well you can use the data. So in this work, uh, these three main contributions, we extend SuperWalk to a diffeomorphic framework. Uh, we, and um, in order to do this, we need to introduce a diffeomorphic uh, layer into the network, and it has to be differentiable. So we also achieve that. And then we want to evaluate the network that we have on some breast MR images. We use both a supervised and unsupervised learning approach. So for context, this is SuperWarp. It's a unit-based architecture. Uh, the nice things about this is the uh, images are concatenated along the batch dimension, so the image features aren't mixed. Uh, this in this contracting path, uh, this is just your standard um, unit encoder. And then in the decoder, that's where like the magic happens. You at each um, decoder block, you extract the flow and then propagate it forward. So you end up with the final deformation being a composition of all your previous um, multi-resolution deformations. So SV FlowNet differs from uh, SuperWall uh, by instead of extracting a deformation at these depoter blocks, you extract a velocity field. And that velocity field is integrated and um, gives you a diffeomorphic deformation. So with these velocity fields, you want to propagate velocity fields because you want to avoid the integration error. So you can do that via addition or the, the way of doing this so that um, your velocity fields um, maintain some nice properties like um, you can use is to use the uh, Campbell House of thinking formula. And so we first introduce this layer and then we also um, implement the Becker Campbell House of velocity fields. So the implementation of this is in Python using Python, which we use stochastic gradient descent, and um, we have a learning rate scheduler uh, that's based on um, a plateau criteria. Uh, we stop optimizing once the learning rate is sufficiently small, it's converged, and um, we use a um, NVIDIA A100 GPU on our HPCs. So First of all, I do an ablation study of the inputs uh, to figure out like, what's working, what isn't. Um, the ablation study um, 
uses SuperWall and there's different ways um, that you can take these multi-resolution displacement fields and apply them to your features. You can just not apply them. You can apply them before you pass into the next block or after you pass into the next block. And we also uh, look at different ways of propagating multi-resolution deformations. Um, one using this addition that I've talked about and the other using this um, Ike Campbell Hauslop thinking formula. Uh, secondly, we compare the accuracy of supervised and unsupervised learning and then uh, the comparison of the approaches and sensitivity to the regularization weight. So the in silico data set that we use for this ablation study is based on um, B-spline warps. So we generate um, random B-spline warps and apply them to uh, an image to generate our image pair. We do this a thousand times, so we get a um, thousand samples and we split them into an 80-10-10 ratio for training, validation, and testing. Uh, the deformations that we generate using these B-splines have a mean Jacobian that's really close to one, which is very important. And um, they have a mean displacement of around uh, 10 million. The evaluation metrics that we use to um, um, evaluate the results of the deep learning approach are the deformation discrepancy. Since we've generated the synthetic data set, we do have ground truth, so we can um, do the um, do something like the MBC between the uh, predicted displacement field and the ground truth displacement field. And then we also use the optimal information that we've determined by the network to resample one of the images and then do a comparison of the image similarity. So first, the supervised approach. Uh, the supervised approach is like regression over the predicted displacement field and the ground truth displacement field. Um, this can give uh, highly accurate results. The, um, on Super Bowl, we find that this is our baseline unit. It's around, you know, um, seven times 10 to the negative two uh, voxel accuracy, whereas um, super warp far outperforms unit. So you see adding multi resolution constraints can really improve the results for supervised learning. And then we find similar results for the diffeomorphic approach. So this is the best performer, this um, red box plot uh, from super warp. And then we get similar results for. Uh, SV flow net, and then you can see propagating the displacements after integration yields a lot of error, which we expect. Which is uh, this? This is the screen box. This is why you know propagating the stationary velocity fields via addition or BCH formula is um, very important. So yeah, we found that. Um, these multi-resolution approaches, far outperform the single resolution approaches, um, and direct composition fails, which we expect, which is why we need to propagate velocity fields via addition or PCH. Uh, these approaches um, of propagation of propagation they um, are comparable with the just multi-resolution approach, and um, PCH outperforms uh, addition. So now we move to the unsupervised learning approach. So this is the approach that um, a lot of researchers are faced with because ground truth deformations aren't typically available. So here you have an image similarity loss plus your regularizer, and this regularizer plays a critical role constraining the displacement field. And so we find with just a simple unit architecture, uh, which is highly unconstrained to get required varying results for the regularizable weight. Whereas when you move to a multi-resolution approach, which is more constrained, you get the results varying significantly less with the regularizable weight. And then we find the same thing with the diffeomorphic approach and um, a slight improvement in accuracy. So we found that you know, the sensitivity of the regularized weight improves with the multi-resolution approach. And then SV Flowernet um, gives us a slight increase in accuracy of uh, the BCH propagation yielding the highest performance. So now the big question is, <laughs> do these results extend to an in vivo experiment? So um, in this 
part of the work, I took some in vivo with them, which is uh, arms up and arms down, which is a, um, a smaller deformation and then prone to supine, just as a test for move to the clinical basis uh, in order to evaluate the ability of deep learning registration to um, provide edible deformations of the underlying mechanics and then compare you know, which network is more suitable. I mean, would this be flow network or simple walk? So this is like a snapshot of the, the data that I'm using. So then you have your full torso uh, breast image and we've extracted a single breast. Um, you can see there's the arms up image in magenta and sorry, the arms down image in magenta and arms up image in cyan. So you can especially see here, there's quite a large displacement. And so in order to evaluate the performance, we first use the deformation regularity. So we want to know uh, what the Jacobian determinant of the deformation field um, is. You know, if it's uh, less than or equal to zero, it's non-physical, get some regions of self-folding, and we expect the deformation to be mass-preserving and also topology-preserving. So we don't want the Jacobian determinant to be less than or equal to zero. So we do like an accumulated um, loss of these self-folding regions. And then we also use the image similarity of the you know, deformation applied to the image to you know, do some something. So these are the results, the image results. Here, this be flown at and super warm. Um, the arms down, image cyan is the arms up, and then purple is aligned. So you see a lot of areas of agreement and then some small regions where you have um, false positives or negatives. And then uh, the displacement regularity, this is just taking a slice. Um, you can see that superwall produces uh, regions where you have a determinant less than or equal to zero. So you have those non-physical self-folding regions, whereas by construction, it used to flow there, it's definitely morphic, so I guarantee you won't get those regions. And so as a snapshot of the um, in vivo results, we have um, SV flow net significantly outperforming uh, support quantization of the self-folding, um, and then you get comparable results on the similarity. So in conclusion, uh, this work has presented SV flow net. It's a novel epimorphic multi-resolution deep learning approach. Uh, these are preliminary results um, that show that this architecture outperforms the multi-resolution approach on Silico and the Vivo data set in future work um, during my PhD, which have just started. Um, going to register prone and supine diagnostic MRI to determine cancer lesion displacement between diagnostic and preoperative positions and um, integrate press biomechanics into uh, these techniques, either as a loss function or to augment the training data. Cool. Thank you. Uh, if I recall right, I think you said your training data, you had a mean displacement of about 10 millimetres or so. Um, what was the range of displacements you had? So plus or minus three millimetres. So it's still fairly small. Did you look to categorize the fair, uh, each of the methods against the size of the displacement that you'd applied? And no, I haven't looked into that yet, but that's something that I'll be looking into with my PhD, especially because some of the deformations between prone and supine, depending on the size of the breast, can be quite large. So that's definitely something that I um, need to do. Four. What is the is there any meaning that can be ascribed to your internal uh, velocity fields that you're essentially adding together to generate the final velocity field? 
I know you're using skip connections through unit, but they're not actually constrained to the, the velocity field that describes the operation at that layer of the registration arm. They could be essentially anything as long as they sum to the final result. Yeah, yeah. You're completely right. Yeah. With, with the output of these layers, you could really parameterize them as whatever you wanted, just as long as. I suppose they serve the purpose of resampling the images. So eventually they need to become a deformation. So a really bad deformation field would make something that's nonsensical and would be hard to register the, the final steps. It's you're actually almost saying that instead of learning the components of the field in each resolution, it's arguably learning the fields that make it easy to register the higher frequency information levels of the So Matt, can you go back to your previous slide, the one that you showed before? The the one where you showed deformation results? For the Ambigo task? This no. I think it's the one that says deformation. You had your Jacobian score, and then you had your deformation. Oh, not that one. You want with your training data, mate. Ah, I see what you mean, yeah. This one, yeah. Yes, yeah. So 9.56 plus, plus or minus 3.22. So how did you, you might have mentioned earlier, but how did you get to that? So like, how did you compute your deformation? Is that from the displacement fields? Um, I just restrict these B-spline deformations so that they give me a Jacobian determinant close to one. Oh, right. So that deformation means to preserve the volume, this is how much deformation you need. And so that's, what does that represent? Um, it's supposed to, Placement. it's supposed to be compatible like with the biomechanics, because you know how, like with the, um, you know, one parameter, you, know, okay, you have just the Jacobian determinant being one. Yeah. I'm trying to make it so that it's comparable to those techniques, but that they definitely need to, you know, these deformations in the future should come from a biomechanics approach in order to make more sense. Yeah, but this was just like a preliminary step using B spline deformations. So this mean here is computed across the 1000 samples. Okay, cool. Time for a few more questions if anyone is still curious. Thank you, Matthew. Um, <laughs> do you think these splines are a good representative model of the type of deformations that you're likely to see when you get people changing poses? Right? Do you have any concern that when you're training it on a field that's generated by a beast spline? You know, we've seen a lot of really good work going towards the main randomization there, right? Looking at how we make this translation. You know, I definitely do think that's a problem, which is why I'm like quite a big fan of integrating the biomechanics. I think that will be sort of the king data augmentation approach. But yeah. That's a own issue. So, right, a lot, a lot of the time we assume heterogeneity. Um, there's also, sorry, this is kind of assumes knowledge of your PhD that you're saying one of the things you want to use the registration for is to provide more accurate information for the biomechanics. So, that if you're including the biomechanics in the right side of the registration, you've got to do it. Yeah, they will sort of be that like chicken or the egg problem. <laughs> comes first, yeah. The registration of the biomechanics, but it's something I'll have to look into during my PhD. Yes, I think there's a little bit more time. Just wondering how you're planning to address um, sliding, because um, my, many of these tissues, there's interactions, and that's part of why there's a large deformation. For example, with the breast, there's um, 
when the shoulder moves, scapula, uh, humerus, they, uh, you know, the muscles are uh, engaged, and then you've got uh, you've got sliding between tissues. So in terms of creating synthetic data sets, in terms of actually validating that, uh, that registration approach, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that's a difficult question. Yeah, I would, I would hope that it could come from the biomechanics, if it could come from like a boundary condition, but... Just <laughs> <laughs> no, the quick note that many biomechanics models don't account for these things. Yeah. They, they certainly don't account for shoulder motion at this stage. Yes. So <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Matt.